Right, I hope you can see my screen okay. Yes. Let me just... Uh... Right, so um, as Madonna so kindly introduced, I'm going to talk about neural tube defects. Uh, and I realized right at the beginning that there are many, many different terminologies for these conditions, depending on which group of professionals are talking. Um, so please, you know, forgive me if I, I use terms that you're not so familiar with and, and, and so forth. I'm going to talk a lot about the human embryo, this beautiful creature here, uh, which was collected as part of our um, HDBR, Human Developmental Biology Resource Activity, and we have our website here. Uh, and and so, um, as Madonna said, we are um, we have been now in operation for more than twenty years. A, a large uh, embryo and fetal biobank um, based in London at, at my university, University College London, and also University of Newcastle in the north of England. And we um, collect and store this material, and then we provide it freely to um, research projects wherever they may be based in the UK and abroad um, and, and in many countries. I'm not only going to talk about um, human, I'm also going to talk about the mouse as being my favourite uh, experimental animal and where we've learnt an enormous amount about neural tube defects. So let me start by just I'm introducing you to a few of the basic features of these conditions. On the left here, we have the human conditions, the main two, uh, anencephaly and myelomeningocele. Um, on the right, we have the mouse defects, as we see in a, a mouse fetus, exencephaly, which is the forerunner of anencephaly, and later in towards the end of pregnancy, the, the fetus and the mouse will develop an anencephalic appearance and this tissue will degenerate. Open spina bifida equivalent to myelomeningocele is, is very, very similar in, in the mouse and in human. So these conditions are common. Uh, on average, I suppose one in a thousand pregnancies. Uh, I say pregnancies, not births, because of course many countries now have extensive prenatal diagnosis and termination of pregnancy programs. And so to express the frequencies in live births is, is inaccurate these days. Uh, so established pregnancies, but there are um, enormous geographical variations in prevalence. So for example, in Ethiopia, where I'm currently doing a collaborative project with, with um, investigators in that country, the frequency is more than 10 times higher than the world average. So over 1% of pregnancies affected by neural tube defects there. Whereas, say, in the United States at the moment, the frequency is below the one in one in a thousand. In the UK, it's roughly 1.2 per thousand at the moment. And the defects that uh, I'm going to be talking about, anencephaly and open spina bifida, myelomeningocele, I consider those to be synonymous. Um, they make up about 80% of all the neural tube defects worldwide. There are some um, other forms, a, a form that we have studied a great deal in the mouse is, is craniorachiesis, so brain and spine open, uh, so, so a neural tube defect that affects the entire body axis, almost the entire axis. Uh, encephalocele is, of course, often included in the neural tube defects. I've put it in a different colour because it has a different mechanism, as I'll speak about in just a moment. And then, of course, probably of particular relevance um, to, to those of you who are neurosurgeons, uh, closed spinal dysraphism, where uh, a great deal of neurosurgery, certainly at my own hospital here at Great Ormond Street in London, um, uh, this is a very important uh, condition that, that it occupies the neurosurgeons uh, clinically. I've put a query here about uh, frequency or percentage, because I don't really have these figures, and I haven't seen good figures on frequency of these uh, these conditions. So what I'm going to do in this talk is, is to give you a, a, a further overview of embryonic development and where the neural tube defects arise. Then I'm going to talk about research and uh, four different projects that are all ongoing in my laboratory at the moment. Um, 
these are progressing towards publication, but in, in, only in one case has have we actually got a publication uh, out, which is on the first one. The others are all in progress. And then finally, I'm going to just say a little bit about primary prevention, um, because the story with folic acid is very interesting, and we have a, a second agent, second vitamin-like substance, inositol, which has been uh, already in clinical trial in pregnancy. So here's another human embryo from our bank, uh, Carnegie stage 16, about six weeks or so, uh, post-conception. And this is really just to remind you that the great majority of the central nervous system, the forebrain, midbrain, hindbrain around here, um, and most of the spinal region are formed by primary neurulation. In the, so the arrows in yellow here. And this is essentially a, a process of closure and a process of zippering. And so it's very much like the zippering of a, a piece of clothing, except that no one is pulling the zipper, it's doing it by itself. So quite remarkable morphogenetic process. It begins at a much younger stage, of course, at this site, at the base of the hindbrain, where the hindbrain joins the, the spine. And this is what we call the closure one site. And then the zippering will occur up into the brain and also simultaneously down the spine. So neural tube closure, then primary neural tube closure is a discontinuous process. It's not happening all in one go. It's happening in different places at different uh, stages uh, uh, and simultaneously in some regions. There's a, a separate initiation site right at the front of the neural plate that zippers backwards. And so that defines an anterior neuropore here, which finally will close. And Similarly, in the low spine, the zippering passes down the spinal region and will eventually close at a posterior neuropore here, an open region that will, will become sealed. And so once, and the anterior neuropore closes first, the posterior neuropore closes a little bit later, and once that has closed, then primary neurulation is finished. But then we have secondary neurulation, which goes on beyond uh, the, the posterior neuropore, and we've mapped this level in the mouse to the S2, second sacral level, and below that is secondary neurulation, a different process not involving any closure, de novo neural tube formation by a canalization process, and I'll show you what that looks like in a moment. So primary neurulation then, when, when disturbed, gives rise to either anencephaly or open spina bifida, or indeed craniorachiesis if this event fails here. Um, secondary neurulation, if it fails, will give rise to skin-covered dysraphic conditions in the low spine. So now diagrammatically, here, here is the, the embryo. Here's the closure one event at the base of the hindbrain where it joins the spine, uh, zippering into the brain and back from the front, the anterior neuroport, the posterior neuroport, and in red, the region of secondary neurulation. And then we can put onto this the defects. So craniorachiesis, anencephaly, and a completely open spine is a lethal condition. Uh, leading to stillbirth, but it's quite in, in, in areas where there's a high frequency of these defects, as was shown in China, for example, there is um, a very significant proportion of the defects have this, this phenotype, this morphology. Anencephaly is variable in its, its location and morphology, depending on which of these cranial events fail. So I would say the most likely, most common thing to happen is that this arrow here is incomplete. Um, the, the, the backward zippering is less often disturbed. If this is disturbed, we will see a facial cleft, whereas here we will have the pure anencephaly. But really any of these events can fail. And we know this also from the mice. The mice can show any of these events failing. Posterior neuropore here, uh, if that fails, then we have uh, myelomeningocele, open spina bifida, as um, as in this uh, baby here. And and the 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 sooner the arrow here uh, arrests and and the closure becomes arrested, the higher the lesion will be. So if the arrest is very low down, then we have a low, a low sort of sacral level. But if the 
a rest is very high up, it can be even thoracic or certainly lumbar. And then the, the closed, skin-covered dysrhythmic conditions are thought, although I would say this is still much less well understood than for the primary neurulation, but are thought to be secondary neurulation abnormalities. Finally, encephalocele. So here's an occipital encephalocele uh, included amongst the neural tube defects, but now I think quite accepted that this is a post neurulation defect of skull development. And so we have an opening in the, in the bony uh, skull and herniation of meninges and or brain material. And of course, this can also be frontal and, and in other locations, occipital being a common form that's seen in the West. So if we look in, in cross-section now, and this is these are mouse data, um, primary neurulation on the left, secondary on the right. What we've done here is to take the caudal, the, the low spinal region. This is the posterior neuropore, and we've sectioned through it from, from distal, from the most caudal end up to the proximal end where the neural tube is formed. And so what you can see is that distally there's a tail bud, I'm going to talk more about that in a moment. And at the region of primary neurulation, the tail bird has a, a relatively flat dorsal surface. And very rapidly, as you progress towards the, the front of the embryo, towards the head, you can see that this neural plate becomes well-defined and quite distinct from the mesoderm beneath. It then bends. It bends prominently in the midline, and this is a bending event that is induced by mesoderm underneath the neural plate, the notochord. And it also bends dorsolaterally here in, a, in paired bending sites. And these paired bending sites bring the neural fold tips together in the midline so that they can fuse and close. We have a mutant, uh, the gene ZIK2, in which these bending sites completely fail to develop in the mouse. And the mouse develops spina bifida from the level at which these uh, bending sites are required onwards, a very large spina bifida. Finally, after fusion, uh, cell adhesion and fusion of the neural folds, there's a very poorly understood remodeling process which occurs in the midline because, of course, the uh, future epidermis, this thin layer of cells you can see here, has to completely cover the neural tube and is distinct from the roof of the neural tube. Whereas here, the ectoderm is continuous with the neural plate on each side. So these tissues have to remodel and change partners so that we end up with the, the final double layered structure. We really don't understand very much about that remodeling process. In the secondary neural tube, again, the same sequence. This is now more caudal in the embryo. And the tail bud here has no dorsal flat neural plate. So that's the difference. Otherwise, they look extremely similar. And I'm going to talk about these cells because they are not just boring mesoderm cells. They're actually stem cells. And I'll talk about those in a moment. But as we go forward um, towards more mature levels, we can see that cells are starting to congregate in the midline dorsally and a cavity is forming and the cavity then expands and we get a rounded neural tube, which is covered with, surf with, with the future epidermis, the, the non-neurectoderm, in the same way as for the primary. But here there's been no closure whatsoever. It's purely a, a candleization or hollowing out process. And so what we think is, is happening here is that this is a typical mesenchyme to epithelium transition which we see in many other organs in the body, for example, during kidney development, we see that very prominently. And so these cells are losing their mesenchymal characteristics and becoming epithelial, forming tight junctions and so on, on the, on the apical surface. And so whereas in the case of the open um, uh, closure, a primary neurulation, the, the defects are open because the neural folds never finally complete closure. Here, most of the defects are ones of tethering to surrounding tissues, and the neural tube fails to fully separate itself during uh, the secondary neurulation process. So some human embryos during primary neurulation. Here's Carnegie stage nine. 
which is extremely difficult to uh, to obtain because this is very early in in pregnancy and our material comes from terminations of pregnancy and these are done very rarely so early. So this embryo is an unusual specimen. Uh, it's got a, a region here that's concave and, and we see exactly the same morphology in the mouse. And in fact, this embryo is a human embryo, but it could it, it would look extremely similar if I showed you a mouse embryo at this stage. It has open an open brain here. It's beginning to close at closure one and it has the open posterior neuropore here. So this is the boundary between the hindbrain and the spinal cord. Has a very extensive yolk sac connection at this stage. Looking on the back of the embryo, just a, a few days later, here's now a region of closed neural tubes. So closure one has progressed forward and backward. And this region is flanked by the somites, the mesodermal blocks, which will then form um, the basis for much of the skeletal and uh, muscle development subsequently. The posterior neuropore here is still open, the open spine, and the brain is still open up here. And then we go forward again to Carnegie stage 11, to just a few more days, and now the brain is pretty much closed. And this is usually the earliest stage that we can um, obtain in our bank. Um, but the posterior neuropore is still open, and the so much you can see have now marched downwards and have developed right down to some distance rostral to the posterior neuropore, and this is the pre-Semitic mesoderm that's not yet segmented. Right, so now I'm going to talk about four of our research studies. And I'll start off by talking in more detail about human caudal body development, and particularly the origin of the secondary neural tube. So we recently completed a study of um, over 100 uh, embryos that were between Carnegie stages 13 and 18. Um, so this is following completion of primary neurulation. The brain is closed in the youngest of these embryos. Uh, the posterior neuropore closed here. This is the hind limb and it has a tail bud. So secondary neurulation is getting underway at this stage. If we go forward five Carnegie stages, then the, the tail is has formed and has regressed. So it so the secondary neurulation is complete by Carnegie stage 18. And then in more detail, we can look at the caudal region of each of these embryos. So the, the, the tail bud at this stage is quite a, a, a large structure, blunt ended and has somites not quite reaching the end of the body axis. But as you go forward, Carnegie stage 14, the tail bud elongates and becomes narrower and more pointed and eventually has this really quite striking pointed structure and at this point it's at its maximum length and it will then begin to degenerate and die back often bending dorsally and you can see 17 and 18 um this is the morphology so as as expected when we look at our Carnegie stage series from 13 to 18 and the days post conception um, we can see that there's a direct relationship as, as expected. And similarly, with the crown rump length of the entire embryo, there's a direct relationship with Carnegie stage. We wanted to know about somite number because um, this is an important feature, as I've said, of mesodermal development. Um, a great deal is known now about the process by which the somites become segmented, the segmentation clock, um, and it was important to, to try to understand how so much number increased to a maximum and then decreased. And although there was a lot of variation in our samples, we, we got we found the maximum so much number at about 37, um, plus or minus a few, uh, in embryos of Carnegie stage 16, this stage here. And by this stage, the so much reached almost to the tip of this rudimentary tail region. And then when we go to 17 and 18, the number of somites decreases again because we're in the regression phase of, of the caudal development. So a rather controversial area, and, and, and this is certainly in the neurosurgical literature, quite controversial, I think, is, is the mode of formation of the human secondary neural tube because it has been suggested that rather than 
being more similar to a, a mouse, which is another mammal, obviously, the, the human secondary neural tube actually resembles more the, the bird, the chick. And so I just wanted, to, we, we really wanted to try to get some definite information on this because there's been a lot of speculation, but not very much hard evidence. And so here, here are some serial sections again, this time I'm, I'm going from left to right rather than top to bottom. But again, we've got the most primitive caudal level here, progressing up to the most rostral level. And this is a chicken embryo. So again, you can see we have an undifferentiated mass of cells at the tip of the uh, uh, body. And then as we go forward, we can see the neural tube is becoming delineated. But interestingly, it forms multiple cavities, multiple lumens. And this is this is present in all embryos. And eventually these cavities coalesce and these cells in, in the center become absorbed into the wall of the neural tube and we get the single cavity finally overlying the notochord here that I mentioned before. So this is from the, the this process has been known for many years. There was a, a very lovely paper in developmental cell um, three years ago by um, Gonzalez, Gobat and, and, and colleagues. And they showed that this res resolution of the multiple lumens into the single lumen required the um, signaling through SMAD proteins, which is a TGF beta signaling pathway. And so they could block that pathway and prevent the resolution of these lumens into the single lumen. So that's typical of the chick embryo. And it's quite different, as you know, from the mouse, because I've shown you these images already. So we see a single lumen forming and it's single from the beginning to the end. Quite simple. So what happens in humans? Well, the, the idea that the human embryo develops like the chick has really come from many, many studies. Um, one of the earliest, uh, Ronald Lemire's study in 1969, published in the very early stages of teratology, the journal, where he saw multiple lumens in the neural tube. And here's a more recent study, uh, again, this time two lumens side by side in the neural tube of the human embryo. And of course, you know, I always go back to Wikipedia, as we all do, and see what it says about neurulation. And what Wikipedia says is, in secondary neurulation, the neuroectoderm forms the medullary cord, which is the future neural tube, which condenses, separates, and then forms cavities, then merge to form a single neural tube. So in other words, Wikipedia is saying that neurulation in the human embryo is like the chicken. Is it really? So we had these two ideas, these two hypotheses. One was a chick-like formation of multiple lumens, which would then coalesce to form a single neural tube at the body. And the other was that the mouse, a mouse-like formation of a single lumen, but which perhaps later on, further up the body, shows some sort of splitting of the neural tube to give multiple lumens that might give the impression of being chick-like, but in fact are more proximal. And what we've seen is very, very clear. So again, I'm showing you sections from the left, most caudal, going up to the to, to, towards the rostral end towards the right. And here are three different embryos at Carnegie stages 14 and 15. And what we can see is that in every case, the lumen that's formed initially is single, like this. The neural tube is very dorsoventrally flattened in the human embryo. These two show it, particularly this one, not quite so starkly. As we go rostrally towards the front of the embryo, the neural tube now splits into two lumens side by side, but then re resolves back into a single lumen again. In this embryo, the lumen remains single for longer, but eventually splits into two dorsoventrally separated lumens. And in this one, the lumen remains flattened but single, and then eventually splits into two side by side. So quite clearly then, the, 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 the truth of the matter is that the human embryo develops its secondary neural tube like the mouse, but with additionally splitting of, of the neural tube in a rather haphazard way. And we would love to know why this happens and what the mechanism is of this. It may be in relation to the, the future degeneration of the spinal cord. Um, 
But of course, the mouse spinal cord in the tail region also degenerates and the mouse doesn't show this. So we're not sure why these, uh, these multiple lumens form, but clearly we have a mouse-like formation of the secondary neural tube. Now to go on to the second project, um, and I don't have an answer to this, but we've been investigating some ideas as to which cell types might potentially give rise to the spinal lipoma that is of such interest surgically and scientifically. So you all know much better than I do about spinal lipoma, um, misplaced adipose tissue, but not typical adipose tissue, multiple misplaced cell types within this tissue, uh, subcutaneous, and then involving the spinal cord very often and requiring neurosurgical intervention, as in this child here. So I think it's an unsolved issue as to where the spinal lipoma forms from, what, what is the cellular origin of this material. It shouldn't be there and it is there ectopically. And so really develop, in terms of development of the embryo, there are two main progenitor populations of cells that we could implicate in this, the neural crest and the neuromesodermal progenitors or NMPs. So I'll take these one at a time. So the neural crest is a fascinating and very important cell lineage. So this is a typical textbook diagram. The neural crest originates in the dorsal part of the neural tube in, in the spinal region after closure, although interestingly in the cranial region before closure. So there's a difference between spine, cranial and spinal neural crest in their, orig in their timing of origin. And the neural crest cells migrate out and they will take different routes through the embryo. So these, these cells here migrate close to the edge of the neural tube and they will form the dorsoric ganglia, which will be the spinal ganglia, the autonomic ganglia. Um, and they will, many of them at, on, at certain levels of the body will go into the developing gut at the vagal level and form the enteric nervous system, uh, forming important parts of the adrenal medulla, for example, as well. Having... And, and posing the origin of neuroblastoma, um, although I think that's still relatively poorly understood. Um, some cells also migrate much more superficially um, <laughs> beneath the epidermis and form the melanocyte populations. So that, that's looking in cross-section, but looking along the body, we have different regions of neural crest and this has been best studied in the chicken but is also seen in in mammals as well and so we have cranial neural crest that forms a lot of the skeletal structures um in, of, of the skull particularly the front of the skull the skull vault as well as many other um, neural structures within the head we have the vagal neural crest it gives rise to the enteric nervous system but also to the outflow tract of the heart we have the trunk neural crest that gives rise in a segmental way to the dorsal root ganglia, to the spinal ganglia. And then in the chicken and birds, we have a sacral neural crest origin as well, which has not really been demonstrated in mammals. Um, so, so that's a bit mysterious, but certainly in, in birds that can be demonstrated. But the question I have is, is there neural crest in the region of secondary neurulation? Because if the neural crest was to be the origin of spinal lipoma, then we would expect the secondary neural tube to be producing neural crest. And perhaps in some circumstances, the differentiation of those cells can become misrooted and, and go into adipose formation. So does caudal neural crest exist? And and specifically, can the secondary neural tube give rise to it? And so we've been looking at this, and Rosie Marshall, my group, has been doing this work. And what she's done is to use a series of molecular markers, so WINT1, FOXD3, SOX9, which are markers of primary neural tube and particularly neural crest. And so you can see that these genes come on in the dorsal neural tube, and they then follow the neural crest. The neural crest cells express these genes. FOXD3 is the best marker we have for neural crest, but when one is also expressed in these SOX9. Now when we when we and, and this is in mouse, so when we look in the in the secondary neural tube of the mouse embryo, although we see some expression in the neural tube here of WINT1 and we 
occasionally see it in the FOX D3 also, we don't see any evidence of migration from the secondary neural tube in the same way as we do for the primary. So that's at face value suggests that, that the secondary neural tube is not capable or is not forming neural crest. However, there's a very um, uh, well-used assay in which, which many, many groups have used and, and we can confirm, you know, this, this assay as being very helpful in many respects, where we take pieces of neural tube and we put them into tissue culture onto a plastic dish or onto a dish coated in fibronectin and cells will leave the neural tube and will migrate away. And we can do this with mouse and we can do this with a piece of human neural tube and the cells will migrate away in vitro. And we can do this with both primary and secondary neural tube and cells will migrate away from both. And so the wisdom in the field is that these cells are neural crest, and therefore they are emigrating from the neural tube onto the dish in the way that they would in vivo out of the neural tube and into the adjacent tissues. So this is puzzling because if the secondary neural tube was not making any neural crest, what, why are these cells coming out? What are these cells? Or maybe we're missing the cells in vivo, and this is telling us that actually there really are neural crest cells from the secondary neural tube. So we wanted to do some molecular analysis here, and Rosie has done RNA sequencing. So this is essentially taking, gathering these cells, removing the neural tube fragment, and taking these individual cells, making RNA, extracting RNA from them, and then sequencing um, from the cDNA to understand which genes are being expressed in them. And she's done a great deal of analysis of this. I'm just showing you a very small part of her analysis. These are all genes that are particularly expressed in the neural crest. So we've seen SOX10 already um, in, in, in my uh, previous slide. And what we find is that these genes are expressed specifically in the primary neural uh, in, in, the, in these cells here coming out of the primary neural tube compared with the secondary outgrowths. So this is a differential expression. And you can see that better here in this so-called gene set enrichment analysis. So each line here is one of the genes in this panel. And if the genes are clustered towards the left-hand side, they are correlated with the primary neural crest. And if they're clustered to the right-hand side, they're correlated with the secondary neural crest. And what we see is that all the genes, except one, are correlated with the primary neural crest. So it appears then that the cells that come from the primary neural tube in culture are truly neural crest cells, but the cells that come from the secondary neural tube in culture are not neural crest. There's something else. And we are now looking to see what these cells might be. They actually, in, in other data, they express uh, muscle markers much more than they do neural crest markers. But we're not sure if this is an in vitro artifact or in vitro phenomenon, or whether this is really uh, rep representing some function that happens in vivo in, in the embryo as well. So I think the conclusion of this study is that the neural crest does not form in mammals, in mice, and in humans from the secondary neural tube. So going on to the second possible um, second possible cell type, if you like, that might be implicated in, in a spinal lipoma. And here, I'm just making a suggestion rather than having any hard evidence. You'll remember that gastrulation is the process whereby the three germ layers, the ectoderm, mesoderm, and endoderm, form from the originally two-layered embryo through the primitive streak and the cells come through and they form the third layer, the mesoderm, in between the dorsal ectoderm and the ventral mesoderm, sorry, the ventral endoderm. So gastrulation was thought to be the entire process responsible for forming the germ layers. But we've had to change our views of this a little bit over the last 10 years or so, because we've realized that gastrulation forms the germ layers in the upper part of the body but the lower part of the body forms after gastrulation is completed and forms by different process. And so this, this process 
relies on these stem cells, these neuromesodermal progenitors. These are cells that have dual potential, at least, to form neural, neural tube, and mesodermal, the somites, and so forth. And so in an embryo like this at Carnegie stage 13, the tail bud here is the site at which we have stem cells, these neuromesodermal progenitors at the caudal end, which are proliferating and they're giving rise to daughter cells that will form neural tube, will form somites, will form the vasculature and so forth. And so this is truly a, re a renewing stem cell population. So of course these cells could potentially start to form adipose tissue as uh, a, an abnormal um, end product, if you like, of their, uh, of their uh, uh, repertoire of differentiation. We can, we can label these cells in, in the mouse um, using a, a, a genetic method, and I won't go into this in detail, but essentially this is a Crelox P system in which we have YFP, yellow fluorescent protein, which is the, the fluorescence here, which is the readout, and this is floxed so that it will only be expressed when Cree is present to remove the LOX P sites. And Cree is driven by a promoter of the uh, Brachiuri T gene, and T is expressed in these cells. And so we can then look to see what these cells go on to form, and they form somites. They appear to form part of the gut, which is something we're looking into at the moment to find out why that is, because that's not generally accepted, and they form part of the neural tube as well. And so the, this is the um, this is the end result, if you like, of development of these stem cells in the uh, in the caudal end of the embryo. So we have the tools to look at the origin of tissues that come from the stem cell population in the tail bud. What we don't have is a mouse model of spinal lipoma, and um, that's really holding us back in terms of being able to fully understand where the spinal lipoma originates. Now going on to the third project, and I'm gonna now move to the front of the embryo, to the brain, and for the, for the final two topics. Anencephaly, why is there a female preponderance? So it's very interesting that these are both neural tube defects, myelomine gacil, anencephaly, uh, both arising from failure of closure of the neural tube, and yet the anencephalic phenotype is much more common in females than in males, whereas the open spina bifida myelomine gacil phenotype has an approximately equal sex ratio, in some studies even male preponderant. And we've known about this for many, many years, um, so, for example, here are some really quite old data, 1973, remarkably detailed studies of data gathered from 1939 right through to 1970, showing female rates of anencephaly twice the male rates in, in different parts of the United Kingdom. Here's, uh, here are mouse data from a mutant mouse that has um, both exencephaly, the forerunner of anencephaly, and spinal defects, and we see that males are in the minority for the brain defects, but show 50% of the spinal defects. So females are particularly at risk of anencephaly, and why is that? So we're, we're, we're pursuing a, a hypothesis that was originally um, described by a group in Canada, uh, Giroloff and Harris, some more than 10 years ago now. And what they said was, this must be a result of X inactivation, X chromosome inactivation. So of course, females are XX and males are XY. And so females, in every cell of the female body, one of the X chromosomes must be inactivated, made non-functional. And, and so here are the two X chromosomes. One is active and one is inactive as a result of having basically epigenetic events, such as placement of methyl groups and switching off of genes. And so this is a, a complex process that's been studied in great, great detail, and I won't go into it, but essentially what this does is to turn off all the genes on one X chromosome so that the female cell then only expresses a single X equivalent to the male. <clears throat> 
And indeed, we know that having two Xs active is detrimental to development. So the classic example of the X and activation mosaic is the tabby cat, which is a female and has um, a, a brown and a black fur gene on the two X chromosomes. And so she shows patches of the two colors, depending on which X chromosome was inactivated in the precursor to that patch of fur. So the hypothesis is that the female cells are having to work harder than the male cells because they're inactivating their X and they're using up methyl groups as a result. And therefore they have a relative starvation of methyl groups, whereas the male is not having to do any of this and so has plenty of methyl groups. And of course, methyl groups are important to switch on and off genes on other chromosomes as well as the X. And those chromosomes are vital for development. And so what, what we then think is that um, the what we think is that the uh, male embryo on balance has more chance of being normal and the female embryo on balance has more chance of developing anencephaly. But of course, the great majority of all embryos develop normally. So we're not saying this is a major cause. We're saying this is a risk, a risk factor that is in the event that something else, a mutant gene or an environmental factor is present, that the females will respond by having a higher frequency of anencephaly than the males. So is this true? Can we get any evidence uh, for this? Uh, slides have frozen. Perhaps it's better down here. Excuse me, my slides are not advancing. Sorry about that. Um, so we've been studying this using another system I haven't mentioned so far, which is whole mass embryo culture, where we can take embryos from the pregnant female, put them into culture and grow them during urulation with or without inhibitors for 24 or longer hours and then study the closure of the brain. And so this gives us a very powerful tool to, to look at in, uh, environmental factors, but also genetic factors. And in all of this, throughout this study, we've then taken a piece of embryo, a piece of yolk sac, genotyped it by polymerase chain reaction to determine embryo sex. Because of course, we're dealing with the stage before the gonads develop, uh, but nevertheless, we can determine the uh, uh, sex composition. So methylation. So the methyl donor for all um, nucleic acids for proteins for lipids is called SAM, s adensyl methionine. And this donates methyl groups to a series of enzymes called methyltransferases. And those enzymes put the methyl groups onto the DNA or the protein. And so we thought that if we take normal embryos and predict that the females may be short of methyl groups, if we were to block the production of SAM, with an inhibitor, cyclolucine, we would see an excess of females affected by neurotube defects. And we already knew that cyclolucine will, will, cause, um, will, will cause the neurotube defects. That was already known. And so we did this with wild-type mice. And amazingly, we found that the females were very, very much more severely, uh, more commonly affected than the males 
in our, our cultures when we use this cyclucine. And these were entirely no, non-mutant mice, completely normal otherwise. So then we wanted to do a, 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 a rescue experiment. So we thought, well, this pathway here is taking away some of the SAM to, for another purpose, polyamine synthesis. So if we could block this enzyme with an, an inhibitor, which we had, we could then restore the SAM and restore the methylation. And so we did this, and lo and behold, the frequency of neural tube defects was reduced, but the females were specifically rescued by this. So this gave us a lot of evidence that, that the X inactivation and using up a lot of methyl groups is actually likely to be correct. But we wanted to go on and do a more ambitious experiment, which was to take female embryos and try to reactivate their X chromosome and see if that would also rescue them. So many years ago, 1982, this study showed that 5-azocytidine, very toxic drug, can reactivate the X chromosome in cells in culture. And so we used a, a, a form of this called decitabine, which is 5-aza2-deoxycytidine, and which specifically blocks incorporation of um, methyl groups into DNA. And this was also known in other studies to be able to assist in reactivating the X chromosome. But no one had ever tried to do this with embryos. This had only been done in cell culture. And so we treated our embryos in the culture system with decitabine. And we first of all looked at the bar bodies. So you may remember that female cells have a bar body, which is the inactive X on the, uh, on the cell membrane. You can see them circled here when they're stained with a particular uh, dye. Whereas male cells do not show this. They have no bar body. They have no inactive X. Then we scored the percentage of cells that had uh, a bar body, and we routinely got about 25% of the cells with a bar body in the females. And the reason it doesn't get to 100% is a technical issue of being able to resolve the bar body in the cells on a, on a slide. But we routinely got 75%. The males showed only a background frequency. When we treated with the drug that caused the neural tube defects, we saw no difference. But when we treated with decitabine, the inhibitor of DNA methylation, we then found that the percentage of cells with the bar body was dramatically reduced. The males were not, not affected. So it did appear then that decitabine is actually able to reduce the number of bar bodies and therefore uh, reactivate the X chromosome. So can we test? Can we test that? Well, we looked at the frequency of defects, first of all, and as predicted, we saw a major female, female rescue when we treated with decitabine, but the males were not affected. They remain roughly 50-50. Finally, we looked at the expression of two genes on the X chromosome to see whether the decitabine would have increased their expression. And so here you can see that the green symbols are the males and the pink and blue symbols are the females. And you can see that the females are showing dramatic increases in expression of these genes when they're treated with decitabine compared with the males. But the most important result was that we then looked at the embryos that were rescued and had no neurotube defect, and they showed the highest expression, but therefore the most reactivation. And the ones that still had the neurotube defect and were not rescued had the lowest reactivation and were equivalent to the males. So the, these results then very strongly support the idea that X inactivation is the reason for the anencephaly predict, predisposition, certainly in mice and potentially in humans as well. Finally, PRE2 malformation, the origin of brain defects in open spina bifida. So Hans Chiari described these four different brain defects where, a long time ago now in the 19th century and you're all very familiar with the herniation of the hindbrain in many many children with with myelomeningocele um, and and also that this can cause compression of the brain stem and may may require decompression surgery it's instrumental in leading to hydrocephalus the advent of fetal surgery has shown that hindbrain herniation is reduced by a, around 50%, maybe more than, than that percentage of cases. Um, and that's when the, when the open lesion is closed in the fetus at 22 weeks.
So once again, we wanted a mouse model of uh, of this condition, and that didn't exist prior to this work. So what we've done is again use the Crelox P system, and we've made the Pax3 gene mutant. So initially it's floxed, and we use Cree to, to remove the LOXP sites and the Pax3 gene becomes mutant. And as a result of that, we induce spina bifida, open, an open, open lesion. But the, the Cree we're using is driven by this gene, CDX2, and CDX2 is expressed only in the caudal part of the embryo and not in the brain, not in the head. So the head of this mouse is wild type, is normal, and from the neck downwards is mutant. And we did that because we wanted to find out whether brain defects in Chiari 2 are truly secondary to the spina bifida, as has been suggested. So we, we checked that this system was working by staining for Pax3 in yellow, and you can see Pax3 is present, uh, DAPI is the nuclear stain. So the yellow stain is present in the head of the mutant and the control and is in the present in the low spine of the, of the control, but completely gone from the mutant. So we have indeed knocked out the gene just in the lower part of the body. And then Mariam, who's a postdoc in my group, has, has started to do an analysis of brain structure. And the first thing she did was to look at just before birth to see, first of all, the, the region that of, of exit from the skull, which we've called the frame and magnum. It's not quite the, it's a very immature form of that at this stage, but she sees no significant difference between the mutants with spina bifida and the wild types. But when she looks at the degree of herniation, she sees a, a large increase in herniation in the case of the mutants. So this, this experiment then shows us for the first time in, in an experimental way that Chiari 2 brain defect is truly secondary to an open spina bifida because it can happen in a wild type head when, it's, when it has spina bifida lower down the body. But what we're particularly interested in is not the hindbrain herniation, it's the higher brain defects. So there are many other defects that are described here. We've got hypergenesis, the corpus callosum, cortical anomalies, basal ganglia defects. They've all been described in, in children with Chiari 2. And these are almost certainly linked to some of the learning difficulties that these children can um, experience. And these defects are generally not prevented by the fetal uh, myelomeningocele surgery because they arise much earlier in development. And so we've now started to look at these defects, and indeed we do see hypogenesis, the corpus callosum, and a compressed cerebral cortex, and many other features in our mice as well. And so we think we have a model not only of hindbrain herniation, but also of these higher brain defects. And specifically, we've started to look at neurogenesis, formation of neurons in the medial ganglionic eminence here. These cells initially are proliferative in this this um, brown zone here, and then the cells leave this proliferative region, become post-mitotic neurons, and they migrate to the cerebral cortex. And these tangentially migrating cells form the um, GABAergic interneurons of the cortex. And in the mutant, we can see gross abnormalities of the MGE. We can see many more cells in the progenitor zone and many fewer cells in the migrating region of neurons. And so we're following this up now. And we're specifically about to embark on this project, which is to test the idea that the cerebrospinal fluid, which is leaking from the open lesion, is directly responsible for the higher brain defects. And it's doing this via increased CSF production rate, because of course the fluid is being lost. So the brain is working hard to make more and that we hypothesize that this is leading to an altered composition of the cerebrospinal fluid and that that itself can affect the neurogenesis. And so we're just getting ready to, to do that study at the moment. So just to conclude then um, on, with those projects, we've shown that the secondary neural tube forms by a process resembling the mouse, not the chick, that the neural crest is unlikely to be responsible for spinal lipoma because we cannot detect it coming from the secondary neural tube. We think the neuromesodermal progenitors are a more attractive option. We found that exon activation reduces methylation capacity and does appear to put 
cranial closure at risk in females. And in the Chiari 2 project, we've found, we've used a mouse model to show that the brain defects are truly secondary to the open spina bifida and that neuro neurogenesis defects may arise from CSF leakage and alterations in perhaps pressure or composition. So finally, and very briefly, just to talk you through the issue of primary prevention. The world is divided into countries that have fortification of the food supply. The bread flour is, is supplemented with folic acid in many countries now throughout North and South America, South Africa, Australia, some parts of the Middle East, um, whereas in Europe this has not been undertaken. And so Europe relies on voluntary supplementation. And, you know, we've had many, many educational programs, but nevertheless, we know that folic acid is relatively underused when it's based on voluntary supplementation. And so in countries where fortification has been introduced, there has been a reduction in prevalence from before to after. These are rates per 10,000. Um, different countries began at different rates. But, but the, the, the reduction has not been the majority. So in the United States, it's been about 30% reduction. And some of these other countries show similar results. So in the United States, there has been a drop before fortification, about one per thousand or 10 per 10,000 is dropped down to about 0.7. But in the UK, where there is no fortification, there has been no significant reduction. And so, we're very interested in the neurotube defects that do not respond to folic acid. And again, the mice come to our, our help because we have mice that do respond to folic acid with neurotube defects that can be modulated, prevented, and those that do not. And this mouse, the curly tail mouse, mutation of the grainy headlight 3 gene is totally resistant to folic acid, but the neurotube defects can be prevented by inositol, myoinositol, or dechiroinositol. Very simple six carbon ring, very similar to glucose. And so we've started, um, we have undertaken a pilot clinical trial of inositol in combination with five milligrams of folic acid, which is the standard treatment. All the women in our study were had a previously affected pregnancy. And so they had um, roughly a one in 25 or one in 30 recurrence risk empirically. So their treatment for a future pregnancy is five milligrams of folic acid, but we gave some of them inositol and some of them a placebo. And so we tried to randomize these women and many of them agreed, but many of them did not agree to be randomized. These are UK women. And the reason they wanted not to be randomized was not through any fear of the treatment, but because they wanted to take inositol once they were told about it. And so these women did not were not randomized, but went ahead and had pregnancies and we followed them up um, and the majority took inositol. So in this study, we had the majority of cases being normal birth outcomes, as you would expect, but three recurrences, all anencephaly in this case, although the original women had had a mixture of myelomeningocele and anencephaly, and the recurrences came only from the groups that took folic acid alone. And we've had no recurrences from anybody who's taken folic acid and inositol. And so um, in terms of primary prevention then, I think the, the world has got to the situation where periconceptional use of folic acid is known to be effective. Folic acid deficiency is a risk factor, and I haven't shown you the data for this, but, but, but we can discuss this if you're interested. The two methods for improving folate status are voluntary supplementation, which certainly in the UK does not reduce the overall NTD rate, food fortification does reduce the NTD rate as shown in North and South America, for example. Some neurotube defects are fairly non-responsive and we are trialing inositol as a possible additional prevention. And so that's the end of my talk. Um, I'd just like to thank these four people who did all of the work in those four projects. Professor Nick Green is my close colleague and we've collaborated on our inositol trial, for example, and many other studies. The HDBR, the Human um, uh, Fetal Biobank, has all, the, all of these staff working on it in both London and Newcastle, and my other colleagues and my funding bodies are listed here.
uh, thank you very much for your attention. Uh, thank you so much, Professor, for your amazing lecture. Very interesting, very <laughs> educational. I, it was like a breath of fresh air because as neurosurgeons, we are used to deal with the technical aspects of the spina bifida and, and uh, um, we, we know the surgical aspects, but we think so little about the, how they came to be and we understand <laughs> so little. It was really um, breath of fresh air and um, I, I think it truly marks the, the shift of neurosurgery from purely mechanical into biological era. And I think it's a really interesting uh, field of research. And I hope many young neurosurgeons in the audience will be inspired uh, and look into this topic. I have one question before I go to the chat part. Uh, it was uh, particularly interesting for me to hear about X inactivation and how it uh, contributes to the females being more affected. And you mentioned the uh, lack of the methyl, the depletion of the methyl groups. That could be the reason. I was thinking of uh, I've I've read that uh, hemimethylation. Uh, it's the uh, it's a protection mechanism from the um, cleavage and restriction from the endonucleus, restriction of the nucleus. Could it be the uh, the reason, like uh, uh, because of the that could the DNA be more prone to the rest self restriction? I think that's a very very good possibility. I mean, meth methylation, you know, has methyl groups have have very specific functions like that. But we also know that many developmentally regulated genes that are needed for events like neural tube closure are switched on and switched off, particularly switched off by methylation of their promoters. So, you know, female cells are doing these jobs, but maybe under circumstances of stress, they're not quite so fit, quite so able to deal with these stresses as our male cells. And this gives us this slight difference in 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 frequency. So I totally agree with you. I think that's a real possibility. Thank you so much. And now I will uh, ask uh, Professor Chahadayo Naal from Malatya. We can unmute his microphone. He wrote the question, but he can ask him uh, himself, Professor. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, sir, for the extra extraordinary lecture. Thanks a lot. You're welcome. Uh, you, are, you are a professor of uh, developmental neurobiology. So what are your future expectations in the field of in uterus surgery? What do you think about the future? Well, I think I think the the, the, the future is, is very bright for this technique because it's serving such an important function and is giving many, many women uh, a, a new a new avenue for their pregnancy, which wasn't there before. Um, I, I think we need to do a lot more follow up on the children who have had repair by fetal surgery compared with postnatal surgery to see to what extent the benefits extend across the whole range of um, of the features of of myelomeningocele. So, for example, we know already that the hindbrain herniation, the Chiari 2, is improved, but we suspect that the data I've seen so far on the, the higher brain lesions suggest no rescue. But what about all the the the, the urological side of you know effects and so forth? So I think I think we need more follow-up, and those papers are now appearing, which is is great to see. Of course, there's also a lot of interest in including stem cells as a sort of potential regenerative aspect with the surgery. And I think there um, it remains to be seen whether th this will this will be fun helpful or not. Um, I heard Diana Farmer talk about this quite recently, and it is remarkable that there is improvement. Certainly in the sheet model, there is a great deal of improvement if stem cells are included. But on the other hand, the stem cells themselves don't actually persist for very long. So they seem to be doing something acellular, releasing some sort of molecular signal that's improving the outcome. So I think this is very exciting and, and you know, I'm watching with interest to see what happens in the future. Uh, thank you, Professor, for your answer. Uh, we have one more comment from Italy. Massimiliano Sanzo wrote, thanks a lot for this magnificent presentation. I appreciate it a lot. 
And we have another command from Bulan Duz uh, from Istanbul Private Practice. Thank you very much uh, for sharing with us this excellent researches. My question is, uh, there is an explanation for higher percentage of lumbar defects than cervical defects. Great question. Thank you, Professor Bulan Duz from Istanbul. That's a really interesting question. <laughs> I mean, I would say that the, the simple answer is that the zippering of the neural tube completes at the lumbar region. And so that's the region that's most likely to be disturbed. Um, and if you think about it, if you think back to the diagram of the zippering that I showed, getting a cervical defect when the rest of the spinal cord is normal is almost impossible because the zippering cannot stop and then start again a bit later. It either stops and never resumes, or it goes all the way down successfully. So mm -hmm. something I, haven't, I didn't have time to talk about, but another project in my lab is we have one mouse that has cervical defects, and it has very variable defects, actually. And, and so almost every embryo and every fetus has a slightly different defect. And what we found with this mouse is that the neural tube closes and then reopens. And so this has been suggested for many, many years in the past that this could be a, a, a mechanism of origin of neural tube defects. And I don't think there was any hard evidence, any experimental evidence, but this particular mouse that we have definitely reopens. We've studied the closure process as normal, but subsequently the cells within the neural tube seem to proliferate abnormally rapidly. And the gene that's knocked out is a gene that regulates proliferation. So that makes sense. And then regions of the neural tube apparently differently in each embryo can burst open. And so we can get a cervical defect. So I, I cannot say that every cervical neural tube defect in humans is caused by reopening, but I think it must be a possibility. Well, thank you. That was really interesting to hear. Uh, Professor Kamiloja, do you have any questions or comments? I think we can give word to uh, Professor Bek Bektash Achekus. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, Professor, giving us the opportunity to listen to your excellent and beautiful research studies. Thank you very much. You're welcome. You're welcome. Thank you. As neurosurgeons, can we add something to your research? You certainly can. <laughs> <laughs> I have a very close collaboration with Mr. Dominic Thompson at Great Ormond Street Hospital that some of you may know. Um, and we, we, we work closely together. Uh, we have a, a, a young neurosurgical trainee who is about to start a PhD degree with me, and she's been working with him um, for the last few years. And so... Yes, the cerebrospinal fluid project that I mentioned for Chiari is going to be done jointly in human and in mouse, and Dominic's clinical practice will be essential for that project. So, yes. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. That sounds amazing and promising. Kabiloja, <laughs> uh, would you like to comment? Uh, your microphone is muted. Uh, yeah. Sorry. <laughs> I also want to thank to Professor Ko. Uh, I also want to thank to everyone who joined us to participate today, this evening. And Madonna. And I see one more comment. Temi Ogaji is from United Kingdom, and he is a future doctor and medical student in here, Georgia. He writes, "Thank you from the." Uh, uh, Tammy, would you like uh, to unmute your microphone so you can? Uh, oh, you can. Just tell me. Okay, here. Hi, hello. Um, thank you for the lecture, Professor Cobb. I just had a question regarding the X inactivation hypothesis. Um, as methylation is important for you know many phenomena in the embryo, would it suggest that females would also be at high risk of um, phenomena such as repeat uh, element transcriptions as well, or not? Well, I, I would have to say yes. I think probably they are. Um, I don't know much about that, that process. Maybe you know more about that than I do. So I don't know what the effect of that would be. 
in terms of cellular function or you know, health or whatever, but really anything, any any function that is dependent on methyl group availability is going to be adversely affected. And perhaps some functions are are not, uh, what should we say, near to a danger threshold, and so therefore they can be tolerated easily. And perhaps other functions are much nearer to a threshold. Is all I can suggest. Um, but but yes, I'm sure you're right. Thank you so much. Thank you, Tammy, for your question. Thank you, Professor, for uh, your responses, for your contribution and sharing your knowledge and experience with us today. Thank you, everyone in the audience, for your contribution. Thank you very much.